uh, what he has going for him is that we can get 66% of the vote and lose. I, I think the only, the last point that I'd like to make on the waterfront is what I hope will not happen, and I think we're overcoming, is I, I hope that the opposition, or that some of the opposition, doesn't come from the same old opposition for the sake of opposition, I think that Peter is referring to. I mean, philosophically, people are more than entitled to have different points of view. Some people, for example, think the whole thing should be a park space. I don't. We have no objection to that. What I hope will not happen is that, that the opposition because it will be seen that if this is developed, this will be something, uh, a success for the Sanders administration. Therefore, anything that is good for the Sanders administration must be automatically opposed. I think there's some of that, but I think what is very exciting is that I think we have a lot of tripartisan support on this. And most people are willing to go forward and say, hey, forget the credit. We don't need the credit. Uh, Fred Bailey doesn't need the credit. Democrats don't need the credit. Let's go forward with all three political factions moving forward. What about the criticism that it's asking the city's taxpayers to forego tax revenues um, and those to subsidize a enclave for the rich? Well, we, I mean, what can I tell you? I mean, you can say, what's the criticism? Why are you having 20-story buildings on the waterfront? We're not. All right, A, we reject the fact that it's an enclave for the rich, and I think I've given you the reasons why. Second of all, you're not foregoing what you otherwise would not have. Now, in fact, if you had a situation, you are building public amenities. I think most people in the city of Burlington understand that if you're talking about building a bicycle path, a community boathouse, and parks, it costs money. Now, how do you build that without public money? One way to do it would simply be to raise taxes right now. I mean, that's a conventional way. We raised a three quarters of a million dollars to build a bike path last year. That's a totally reasonable way. We choose not to do that. We choose to raise the revenue by taking the tax money generated by the new development. So we don't accept basically that argument. We think given no federal money, given no state money, to build these public amenities, this kind of open waterfront for the people without having to raise taxes, and five years down the line beginning to bring in substantial sums of money for the people of the city is a real coup. And I think Peter Clavel deserves a lot of credit, and his office deserves a lot of credit for having negotiated this agreement. Again, I want to point this out. Nothing that anybody does in government is ever perfect. Some of you will recall that virtually every Board of Aldermen's meeting that we discussed this issue, I stopped and I would say to every member of the Board of Aldermen, if you have a better idea on how to build public amenities for the people of Burlington without raising taxes, please, let's hear it. Let's understand your idea. We have not heard any better idea. This is the best idea that has been brought forward. We are operating without federal money. We're going to do something that's beautiful. We're not going to, be able to, we're not going to have to raise taxes. I think that that's quite an achievement.
have to be vigilant and do the best that we can in the future. So once again, we thank uh, all the people who, who supported us. Uh, the second point that I want to make, and it, it deals with the waterfront, but it goes beyond the waterfront. Because in many respects, if we forget about the plain political opposition which existed, and obviously, any time you go forward with any idea, you can have a certain amount of just plain old, petty political opposition. What is very interesting about the debate that took place is that people said, it ain't good enough. We want something better. And that is an absolutely legitimate concern. The problem that we have had on the waterfront and will continue to have on virtually every program that this city goes forward with, whether it's in education, whether it's in police protection, whether it's in a dozen different areas of concern to the people, is that it is very hard to come up with types of alternatives that we want given the tremendous financial constrictions that the city of Burlington and virtually every other city and town in the state of Vermont is able to function under. You know, people in the past have criticized me and my administration for talking about federal issues. Why do you waste your time on federal issues? And of course, the bottom line is that so long as the federal government continues to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on the military, much of it on unnecessary wasteful programs, so long as the federal government continues to give gigantic tax breaks to the rich and the corporations, and then suddenly understanding, gee whiz, we have a big deficit, and then as a response to the deficit crisis, cuts programs that working people need, that poor people need, that the elderly need, that the cities and towns need. So long as that process goes on, let me tell you, not only will Burlington suffer, not only will every other city and town in the state of Vermont suffer, but virtually every community except the most wealthy throughout this country will continue to suffer. So the dilemma is not, the problem is not, gee, we want something better. Unfortunately, too often we're going to have to say, this is the best that we can do without having to raise property taxes and drive poor people out of the homes that they own or create situations where rents go off the wall. So the, the answer, the, the, the questions will not be framed in necessarily what's the best, but what can a city under serious financial uh, constraints actually provide to the people? And that takes us again to the area that you will see increasingly this city involved in, and that is the role of state government relating to the cities and towns of Vermont and to the city of Burlington. In not too many months from now, we expect the school board will be coming forward with a need to raise revenue from the taxpayers. And our position is that the members of the Burlington delegation to the Vermont State Legislature, the senators, Chittenden County senators, should tell the governor and the legislature that they will support no tax increases, they will support no increase in state aid education unless there is a new formula which deals fairly with the city of Burlington. It is totally beyond comprehension that this city continues to expend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars which go to state aid education and we get virtually nothing back from Montpelier. That has got to be changed and I hope that all of the Democrats and the Republicans uh, who represent our community, both in the county and in the city of Burlington, will stand firm on that issue. But once again, unless there is not substantial help in a whole variety of ways from state government, for example, we go back to the old project. The project could have been a more attractive project in retrospect if the state had said, well, we're willing to put a state park on the waterfront of Burlington. We are willing to have a statewide museum in the Green Mountain Power Building so that the local property taxpayers would not have to subsidize that. Now, in truth, this is not a criticism of this legislature or this governor. That's nothing that has been done. I think programs like that have not been developed in the past. But I think whether it's the landfill, whether it's the waterfront, whether it's education, whether it's a dozen other programs, with the fact that the federal government is turning its back on cities and towns, the state of Vermont is going to have to take a much more active uh, approach to dealing with the communities. That's what, my statement. Can you uh, tell us, Mayor, if there's anything specifically you have in mind uh, for the waterfront's future. I know last night you mentioned this about uh, you know going back to the drawing board and all this sort of thing. You mentioned today talking with Alden. Alden says that they're not going to be the major developer down there anymore. Alden may be right. Uh, I think I do have some ideas, and some of us do, but I think it would be premature to, uh, to announce them at this point. I mean, again, I, I just want to emphasize that in the opposition, it's interesting to hear the opposition, to hear some people who are very, very upset that we're not going to generate immediate tax revenue uh, for the schools and for the city. If you follow that logic to its real conclusion, what some of those people are say, is saying is, hey, we don't really care what's down there. Let's get some construction down there. Let's get some building down there so we can generate some immediate tax revenue. 
I personally will never support that proposal. On the other hand, there are people who at the same time talking about lost revenue coming from down there saying, let's have a goal as a public park. That also does not make a lot of sense to me. Uh, the dilemma, again, is how you have mixed development, how you can do it without raising the regressive property tax, and how you can have the kind of activities down there that people from all walks of life can enjoy. And anyone who thinks that developing that program is so simple is very, very mistaken. We hear from critics who say, why don't you have moderate income housing on the waterfront? There's nobody who would like to have moderate income housing on that waterfront more than I. And this administration is working day and night to provide moderate income housing in the city, and we're having some success. We're talking about over 200 units of moderate income housing being built. But historically, if everybody who knows anything about this understands, moderate income housing and low income housing, senior citizen housing, has been built with federal subsidies. And if the federal government turns its back on communities, it is very, very difficult to do. Would it be fair to say that your ideas do not involve any kind of property tax increase or uh, uh, any bonding at all? By let, I, let me not comment uh, specifically on that. I, I think what we thought when we went into this, people said to us, they said, we don't like tax incremental financing. We have problems with it. And they're right. Tax incremental financing is not the world's greatest approach. No one denies that. And our feeling, what we said then and what we repeat now, if we had gone forward to the people and say we need three, four million dollars for a general bond issue in order to buy public, buy property on the waterfront to convert it to public use, do you think we would have won that? I don't think not only would we not have gotten the 54% that we got yesterday, I doubt if you would have gotten 25 or 30 percent. Let us not forget that the people of Burlington suffered rather terribly as a result of state mandated reappraisal. Okay, they were hit very, very hard. And I do not believe that there's any way in God's earth that the people of Burlington would have voted 66% for a GO bond issue to buy property on the waterfront and have their property taxes raised substantially. I just don't believe that. That's why we came up with the tax incremental financing, understanding the true limitations of that program, the negative, but feeling that that was better than going forward with a property tax uh, increase. So Bob, I, I, you'll, you'll forgive me right now. I think I'll have something more to say probably in a week or so. Uh, but at this point, uh, I have nothing definitive to say uh, as to how we'll go forward, other than to say, my view remains that I will not allow development, I will do everything that I personally can do, not to allow development down there, uh, which is going to take away that access that the people of the city and their children and grandchildren are entitled to have. Would well, they you're in, for any, anything Stuart, that's a good question. Maybe tomorrow, maybe 10 years. I honestly don't know the answer, and I'll be snooping around for the next week uh, talking to people and seeing what we can learn. I think what we said before the election and what we say after the election is that we see two possibilities developing. Uh, one is no development. And between you and me, I would rather have no development down there than unacceptable development. Uh, and that may be the future scenario, no development. Uh, okay, so that, that's the one. The second scenario that, that frightens me, to tell you the truth, is the possibility of Alden selling off piece by piece of its 12 acres, and you have some condos over here, and you have some retail development over here, and you have this over there, and that over there, and you have nothing for the people. That's the negative, that's the frightening future uh, that we will do everything that we can to control. Uh, but once again, the bottom line, so far as I see, is that public access, public parks require public money. You don't get it from the feds, you don't get it from the state, you're going to have to get it locally. If people can't afford to pay increased property taxes for that, you really have some difficult uh, problems uh, on your hand. Will you be talking with Alden or any other developers uh, encouraging Alden to restart up their plan at all? Let me first talk to Alden. In fact, you know, I read the papers today, and I have not talked to uh, Mr. Flynn since that, and just get an assessment as to where they are at and, and what options they see uh, for the future. Do you see any possibility of them coming back? Uh, I can't answer that. I don't know. Uh, if uh, the state of Vermont does not substantially increase its uh, role in providing services to local government to insist it should do to avoid a uh, as recently as uh, two hours ago, the governor once again made it very clear that the state would be in no position to pick up that path, even in the face of Grand Rutland and a tax bill and so forth. Uh, what's going to happen? I mean, in real terms, that real people can understand. Well, I think you're going to see a very bitter conflict between state government, municipalities, working people, people concerned about education, uh, all over the state. That's what you're going to see. It is not good enough. We understand, we really do, that the 
governor and the legislature also have their share of problems. I really do understand that. But we think they have a variety of options by which they can progressively go out and raise revenue. We don't. And if all that they can say to us is, go out and raise the property tax some more if you want to pay for your police or fire service, or you want to pay to educate your kids, that is not an intelligent, public-spirited response that a governor or the legislature should have. I once again point out that if the state of Vermont had the guts to decouple and had the guts to bring back the tax rate that it was before Reagan lowered taxes for rich people and corporations, within the state of Vermont, we're talking about raising tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars in a way that which would allow working people and elderly and poor people not to have to pay more taxes. That's not, that's not an economic question. It's a, it's a political question. It's a question of guts. Do they have the guts to do that, or are they going to ask working people to be paying more and more property taxes but suffer the loss of services? Uh, we understand what the governor's position is. We understand what the position is of many members of the legislature. We will now enforce, along with, I think, many other uh, municipal officials to oppose that. So I'm not asking you what kind of fights the politicians are going to engage in. I'm asking you, what is the average person going to have to do with that? Well, it's too early for us to, to comment on that right now. I think what you're looking at is one of two things, or maybe one of three things. You're looking at, obviously, if you don't raise additional revenues, and you're losing a million dollars of revenue share, you're losing, looking at a cut in services. That's one thing. Number two, you're looking at the possibility of local property taxes to replace the loss of revenue sharing. And number three, what I think uh, is, is the most viable alternative that we have citywide is uh, the, the, the creation of an alternative to the property tax. And as you know, I put together a committee of business people who are working with city officials, members of the Board of Aldermen. We held our first meeting. And I think what people in the business community understand, that the degree that there is a loss of services uh, within Burlington, they will suffer as a result. And I think the first meeting was a positive meeting. I hope that uh, within a couple of weeks we'll have some concrete uh, uh, resolutions coming out of that, that committee for alternatives to the Mayor Sanders, getting back to the uh, water for this, uh, when you break it down by wards, uh, it won a two to one majority of Ward 6, considered a more affluent ward, and went down to the strongest of its defeats in Ward 2 and Ward 3. Right. You're considering a run for governor. Uh, how do you see that support and lack of support affecting your race? And uh, I have another question after that. Mark, you'll excuse me. I don't want to get into, once again, the race for governor. We are just dealing, you know, I dealt with the waterfront issue, which to me is of extraordinary importance to Berlin. But let me, let me deal with your question as best I can. I would answer it by saying, if you want to know a blatant political answer, as to how progressives are doing in the city of Burlington. I would say that after four and a half years of rather bitter struggles and fights and elections, that probably today, in my honest opinion, we are stronger than we have ever been before. I spent a lot of time in Ward 3, and I was at the polling place yesterday for a number of hours in Ward 3, and talked to many people, and talked to many people, working class people who said, Bernie, I am voting against this bond issue. And they told me why. They're concerned about increased property taxes. They're concerned about revenue not coming into the schools. They're concerned about the problems of gentrification. Their concerns are legitimate concerns. I've knocked on many doors in wards two and three. My feeling is that people there understand that this administration is trying, under very difficult circumstances, as hard as it can, to protect the interests of the working people and low-income people. And the proposal that we came up with was a good proposal. People, for reasonable reasons, said, no, I can't support you on that proposal. Uh, needless to say, we would have loved to have gotten 66% of the vote in every ward in the city. We didn't. Uh, I think that the people understand we're trying our best on this issue for a variety of reasons, some of which I've just indicated to you they chose not to support. Politically, in this city, uh, I'm feeling uh, quite good.